All right, everybody, uh, thank you for coming to the first instance of Design at Large for the spring quarter. This is a seminar that Scott Plummer has been organizing this year. Um, in the fall and this winter, he brought a lot of amazing speakers to show the range of ways that people are intervening in the world to change our experiences in it. And this quarter, I'm Lily Irani from the Communication Department, and I've organized the seminar uh, to c bring speakers who connect design, infrastructure, policy, STS. I'm really excited that we get to have this interdisciplinary perspective across the year. Um, I wanted to make a quick note as to why we're meeting in the Marshall Center and why we're at Cal IT2. Um, it's been really important to us over the year to have this seminar be in a space that's not identified with any one particular discipline. Because we're trying to bring audiences and speakers together to generate a discussion about what design is, what design can be, and what it's going to be what it can be for us here at UCSD based on the work that we're already doing, that we're already interested in. And that's a conversation that doesn't have a home field. So yeah, so we're going to be in the Marshall Center for the first couple of sessions, and then we're also going to be in Cal IT2 for some of the quarters. So take a look at the website to see <laughs> before you come uh, to see which one is going to be. Um, really excited to welcome Fernando Dominguez Rubio as our first speaker of the series, along with me, on a panel on design as politics. So Fernando is an assistant professor in communication. I am as well. And um, Fernando works on sociology of digital infrastructures, uh, issues of archiving, creativity, and the arts. Uh, one of his major projects has been ethnography of SF MoMA, sorry, no, <laughs> of MoMA in New York, and their challenges in trying to archive digital artworks. Um, and he also is involved in urban activism, engaged with architects and planners, especially in Spain, also in New York, no? Well, in Spain. Yeah, so he'll be talking about some of those experiences. And one of the things that was notable was when I met Fernando as a new faculty member this year, even though he's coming from sociology and mostly working with urban planners and architects, uh, and I've been mostly working with digital media uh, and digital labor kind of design as politics, we had a lot in common. So we're kind of juxtaposing our two cases and laying it out for you all to find your own points of connection coming from your own different disciplines and concerns with design. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Fernando. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, well, you, you uh, wait. And you can give me your <laughs> yeah. uh, So, thank you very much for the invitation. And I, well, as Lily said, I come from, I don't come from computer science, and so my take on design is going to be slightly different. But I think that some of the things that I'm going to be talking about, I think that it's going to be easy to see why they overlap, or the kind of lessons that you can draw from this, uh, um, are fruitful for discussions about uh, politics of design in in a more general way. So the topic, I mean, the title is on the political capacities of design, and I will explain what that means. So the general aim is uh, to ask the question, to raise the question of uh, what are the political capacities of design? It's a great um, question for 20 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so I'm going to uh, try to narrow it down a little bit. So explore the capacities of design to define what counts as political. Still, for 20 minutes, is uh, a lot, uh, so I, I, I'm going to give you a couple of warnings. Uh, so I'm going to, I have a lot of um, examples. Uh, I'm going to fly over the examples. I don't know if you're familiar with urban theory. Some of these uh, examples are just for uh, uh, in architecture and urban um, studies are really basic. So I'm going to try to fly over them and just give a, give a little bit of detail. And I'm more interested actually in provoking a conversation than in. Uh, um, you know, adding nuance to uh, uh, all the cases. Um, okay, so one way in which uh, design has can be broadly, very broadly defined is as a problem solving practice. So the business of design and designers is to provide you know, solutions. So what I'm going to try to do in the talk is to explore exactly the opposite, is to explore the possibility of thinking of design as a problem causing and problem posing uh, question. So I'm going to explore the possibility of what if we think of design uh, in terms of um, its ability to create and raise problems. Uh, now, let me first go back to uh, the politics of, of design, how the politics of design have been understood when it has been defined as a problem solving practice. 
Now, when it has been uh, defined as a problem solving practice, the main, um, can you see that? Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry for the fault. Uh, it is a problem causing practice. Yeah, it is. It is. Very good Yeah. Uh, that's the point. <laughs> it's the point. So, so, one of the ways in which, uh, when we think about design as a problem solving practice, uh, I think that. Uh, most of the discussion has been focused on what I would like to call the unfolding capacities of design. And by unfolding capacities of design, I define the capacity of design to inscribe, congeal, or hardwire programs and codes into material, spaces, and bodies. This is a very abstract definition, but with the examples, I will, it, it will hopefully become uh, clearer. Now, this discussion about unfolding capacities have been, uh, has, has divided the camp in two big groups. Uh, the, the, the guys who are the apologists of design, this is a good thing, that design can actually inscribe codes uh, into spaces, behaviors, and objects, and the critics. And I'm going to go very quickly over each of those uh, groups um, first. So let's meet, let me start with the uh, apologists, and this is one of the great ones. Um, and for the apologists, uh, uh, design uh, the unfolding capacities of, designs, uh, of design are good because they are a powerful form of indirect rule. Uh, thanks to its ability to influence behavior through tacit, invisible uh, codes and programs. So uh, a very famous example in urban theory is what I would like to call the unfolding of Paris. So in the 19th century, Paris is an ungovernable, ungovernable and insolubile city that is rife with conflict. There are three revolutions in the, in the span of three decades. Uh, there is insecurity, and there, there are epidemics uh, 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 that are fatal in, in the city. So uh, the solution to this problem was uh, sought in the, actually in the unfolding capacities of the sign. And it was the Baron, well, oh God, you didn't see anything, right? So it's Hausmann who is uh, in charge of the renovation of Paris between 53 and, and the 70s, and the whole point, uh, in his own words, to re it was to regularize the disorder city to disclose its new order by means of a pure schematic layout which would disentangle the city from its drops. So the idea was basically uh, to use, uh, the belief was that design, urban design, uh, could instill codes of action and morality. And specifically, that design could be used as a tool of moral and political regeneration. So thanks to this new built environment, uh, the, the city was capable, that, well, that is what uh, Hausmann thought, was capable of keeping order, and keeping morality, and keeping, um, keeping a healthy environment. Now another famous, very famous example is uh, the, yes? I'm curious what you mean by design here. And I know that you know, words don't have meanings and all that jazz, but it's, it's a hard one to... So in, what, what kinds of things are you thinking about when you're talking about design? So in this design? case, it's the design of Urban 4. Uh, so for example, I mean the, the design of the boulevards, the design of big squares, uh, the design of uh, the infrastructure of the city. So that is the practice, the, I mean, the design of Urban 4. Okay? And here's another example. So, is also on Paris, is the uh, Cougusier Plan Boisin uh, in 1925. And this plan was even more radical. The idea was to bulldoze the whole center of the city and to create uh, in the center of the city a new city for 3 million people. And uh, the idea was basically to unfold through this uh, new uh, urban design um, some of the basic tenets of uh, capitalism. So it was rationality, functionality, and that was going to be promoted through this uh, urban design. Okay, this one didn't get uh, built, but uh, the Kubus here had the, the chance of building actually a new city from the start. And this is uh, in Tanzibar, in India, right after the independence. Nehru commissioned uh, the Corpus, uh, the Corpus here, uh, the, the plan of creating a new city that was going to embody the principles of rationality, functionality of the new India, uh, the modern India. And the, the, uh, the Corpus's uh, words are really well um, 
telling, and the idea is to enlighten the present and future citizens of Chandigarh about the basic concept of planning the city so that they can become its guardians and save from the winds of the. <coughs> so it's the same belief that through the building of uh, built form, you can shape uh, action and you can save morality and politics, actually. And this is another one, the last one, uh, another famous example. The first one was about unfolding capitalism or the principle of capitalism. This one is about unfolding communism. Uh, and this is uh, Ginsburg and uh, Narcofin building that was built in, in 1932 in the Soviet Union. And uh, they called these buildings social condensers. So the idea was to uh, create buildings that were going to promote a communist lifestyle. Uh, they, they were going to um, knock down hierarchies, barriers, and it was going to create an egalitarian space. So it's the same belief. Now, of course, I mean, this, this, this idea of unfolding uh, codes and programs doesn't need to take place at this, at this uh, grand level of urban intervention. And folding mechanisms are, uh, operate at every scale of human action. And I'm going to give you this one because I love it. Uh, so you have a problem <laughs> like this, this one, and, and, and the solution is this one. Uh, so how do I get my husband to pee in the toilet? Uh, threaten him, pee outside the toilet, toilet no, se no sex. So that's the solution, but there is another solution, which is a design solution, which is this one, which is, has become really famous, which is the tiger fly, and this basically reduces uh, uh, 60 or 70 percent of people be inside uh, the toilet as a result of putting the target fly. In Europe, they have this other version. I don't know if you can see it. It's a goal with a um, with a football. Uh, uh, so you can score. I think with this one, the, the percentage of people is actually higher. Um, so that is how basic male psychology is, and how easily you can operate with it. Um, this is another one, uh, which is uh, a, a really annoying problem in London, is what tourists do, and then they go to London, they don't know that actually in London you have to place your, uh, in, your positioning escalator is on the other side, nobody knows that, and they, they create these huge uh, uh, clogs in the escalators. So there is a design solution, which is uh, to put a, a little, uh, this, those footprints and solves the problem. And you have uh, this one, which is also uh, one that is championed by, all, by the proponents of uh, design and the uh, virtue of its unfolding capacities, which is child obesity in school. And it has been shown that if you design the cafeteria in specific ways, you can increase healthy choices, depending on where you put the food and depending on when, uh, you, uh, how you design the layout of uh, the cafeteria. So the point is that for the apologists, the unfolding capacities of the science, its ability to, to encode and program, um, or to introduce prompts, uh, codes and programs into spaces, bodies, and, and, and things, is good because it pacifies the political. So it's a tool, of, a, a tool of pacification, in the sense that it resolves problems, it solves conflicts, and then it creates a smooth user interface. So you only need to deal with the interface, and then the problems is, are, are resolved. Now let, let me move to the critics, uh, which have a different take on what the unfolding, uh, the unfolding capacities of design do. And what they claim is that uh, this unfolding of design creates an invisible form of power that operates outside democratic control and accountability. Now you have really rough theories like the light bulb conspiracy, uh, so basically the, everything is coded and encoded so that you keep buying the stuff and everything is programmed and you don't know if you're duped into buying it. And you have more classical <coughs> approaches like the hidden uh, persuaders, it's a classic by uh, Lance uh, Packard, and, and one of the points uh, that he made and that is, is, uh, is still being made is that all these unfolding mechanisms that we are not aware of and that match, and that's the, one of the challenges, as into doing things like uh, you know place making in supermarkets, you end up buying things that you don't want to, but they are strategically positioned to play with uh, your unconscious. You make all these unconscious choices. This is a very famous example in Europe, and this is a, the, the Ryanair um, uh, website. And there are different uh, um, um, court rulings against the design of this web page because everything is done so that you you make the wrong choices. Uh, so you don't, you, if you don't want uh, an insurance, uh, the, the only way you, you can uh, 
not have any, not buy any insurances by going to a list of countries. And the last one, which is not even alphabetically uh, order, is travel without insurance. Most people end up buying insurance, uh, even if they didn't want to, because they didn't see the opt-out clause. Uh, and Ryanair is very famous for doing these uh, kind of things. And I don't know if you know this book, it's a fantastic book that has just come out in 2013, and it's by Natasha Doe's school, and it's a diction by design, and she explores Las Vegas, and she explores how everything from the air to the light to the layout is meticulously designed so to increase addiction in the, in the, in the space. So basically the, the point that the critics are making is that enfolding um, in place a passive model of, city, uh, of citizenship. And that's what uh, Thayer and Sustin uh, call the libertarian paternalism, they promote it. Um, and the problem is that uh, you are, uh, with, with this kind of designs, you are oper operating at the level of the sub uh, subconscious. So you are playing with the subconscious of the of people and you are just um, nudging them into doing things even when they don't acknowledge uh, it. And this, one of the problems that it creates what I would like to call a subpolitical sphere, which is a, a sphere in which political decisions are made, but they are made lar largely beyond the democratic control and accountability of citizens. So for example, a very stupid and visual example is that when you're clicking, if you're turning on or, or off the lights, there's a user interface that is perfectly uh, apolitical, but actually that relies on a whole subpolitical world in which a lot of things uh, have been made and it's basically black box and you don't have access to them. Okay, so those are the, the two camps, the, 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 the apologists and the critics, and I think that they, in a way, are kind of both wrong, uh, because they assume uh, what I would like to call the performative illusion. And the performative illusion is the idea that uh, effects and practices follow for intentions and programs. So they give too much power to the sign uh, by thinking that uh, whatever we encode in a design uh, is going to end up uh, having the effect that we intended. And I think that they tend to assume that connection too often and too lightly. Just to give you an example, uh, so this 40%, uh, uh, so I would say 70% of people end up peeing in the right place, but 40% don't. And I'm more interested in the ones that don't and why they don't than in the survey <laughs> actually that do. Uh, so, and, and this is another website, I don't know if you know this website, it's IKEA like Hackers. So again, uh, people are constantly re-adapting, reusing, changing the designs that, uh, that we're giving to them. This is uh, very, oh, but what I wanted to say is that I think that what they don't, they don't see is that actually design is always an ironic practice, yeah. which ends up having effects that no one intended, and that sometimes are ironic commentaries on the original intentions of the designer. So this is one in which the irony is revealed. This is Hausmann Paris, which uh, is not right what he intended in the first uh, place. It has been readapted, it has been hacked, it has been squatted, and transformed into a whole different thing. And sometimes the users actually couldn't care less about uh, what was uh, the, what the, the original programs were. So this is the narco film building today. So the one that was supposed to promote communism is just an abandoned building, uh, and it has been squatted. It basically doesn't work as the or, uh, designers originally intended, and this is uh, the Corbusier Tandiga today. Uh, so there's a flea market, people hang their clothes there, and the rest of it is deserted. So all this, uh, let's build a rational man, and let's uh, promote it, has ended up in a whole different uh, place. Now, as a designer, I think that you can, uh, when you take this irony into account, you can, you can do a couple of things. One of the things that you can do is try very hard to close the gap between code and practice. Okay, so it's a problem of my design, I have to improve my design and to close that practice so that uh, uh, the next time they will do what I want. You can also be one of these whining designers in, ar in architecture, there are a lot of them, uh, who claim that the users don't get it, and uh, mm -hmm. they're wrong, they're using my design in the wrong way. Um, or, alternatively, uh, and that's my preferred route, you can ask these two questions. And one of the questions is, what do you think instead of trying to overcome the, 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 the gap between code and practice, we accept the limitations of design. And if we accept the limitations of design, we are modest rather than immodest. 
uh, what if instead of trying to decide uh, to use design to prescribe codes uh, of actions and thought, we focus on the capacity of design to propose and open up the possibility of new forms of action and thought. And that leads me to the second set of uh, uh, capacities that design, I think, has and that have been not, they haven't been explored. And these are what I call the unfolding capacities of design, as opposed to the unfolding capacities of design. So what do I mean by unfolding? Well, as by unfolding, I mean the capacity of design to propose new kinds of bodies, entities, and sites as political bodies, entities, and sites. And how can, the, uh, how can design do this? I think that we can do it in at least three different ways. And I'm going to explore each one of them through different examples. The first one is by enlarging uh, the political. And what, what I mean is that design has the capacity to open up the possibility of transforming everyday actions and domestic spaces into political ones. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. One is this. Uh, these are um, um, energy uh, 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 meters uh, that uh, you can place in your house and they tell you how much energy you are consuming. There are many different uh, designs for, for them. This is one of them. And each one tells, I mean, each slide tells you if you're consuming too much in the, uh, water or electricity or uh, ironing, whatever. Okay? Now, what I want to suggest is that these kind of devices uh, offer the possibility of blurring the distinction between public and private spaces and between political actions and everyday practice. And they do so by offering the possibility of seeing seemingly harmless and stupid uh, activities, domestic and private activities like taking a bath, uh, cooking, or just watching TV, as things that have implications at other scales of action. And what they actually enabled you to do is to see the private space of the home as I, as I said where it is possible to make political decisions to participate in larger political projects like for example sustainable societies or low carbon economy. Now I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting where it is possible because they need to do that. Actually most people who, most people who have um, who use these uh, designs, they use it just to reduce their bills. So, so they want to save some money, and that's it. Now the point is that you can use them to reduce your bill, but they also allow you the possibility to use them for uh, creating political communities, to unfold in the domestic space as a political space. And this is, for example, what is happening in London, in which a lot of people are using these devices to uh, uh, um, promote uh, um, energy co cooperatives in which uh, they are creating a new uh, 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 um, political community. So you can use these things actually to unfold the house as a domestic, uh, not, not just as a domestic space, but as a, a site of political activism, and as a site in which you can unfold a political community. Now another example is this, this is uh, my city, Madrid, and this is a typical uh, image uh, that is shown for a tourist, and that doesn't know what everybody sees in Madrid, what everybody sees in Madrid is this, uh, every day, uh, and, and this is never featured in, the, in or has for all time not featured in the news because one of the main uh, uh, sources of uh, income or revenue for the city is tourism. And you don't want to say to tourists that you're going to come here and uh, to a, a city, a city like this. So one of the things that the um, uh, city mayor did was to relocate the meters in the city, uh, the, uh, the monitor uh, um, quality, and they put it next to parks. So that the winds of the city uh, are, are always are always offer this rosy image that the city has really uh, good uh, air quality, <coughs> and we have the data actually. And so what a bunch of designers started to do uh, was to create a new design, which is a self-made <coughs> monitoring device that you can use to create a network of readings, which produce an entirely different um, reading of the city as a community city. One of the, the things that happened as a result of that is that air, for the first time, became a topic, a political, a topic of political discussion, of, of controversy in the city. <coughs> so what I'm trying to say is that through these designs, something that wasn't political in the first place, like air, and air quality became uh, uh, political. 
And this is, I don't know if you know this one. This one is uh, creating a huge uh, set of problems in China. They're using this called the egg uh, monitor device, air quality monitor device. And in China, a lot of uh, people are using this to um, uh, counter official statistics about air quality. So it's the same thing at a larger scale. So the point here is that these devices, the, the mon these monitoring devices, are designed to enlarge or, or enable uh, an enlargement of what counts as political. So the domestic space can be a site of political action, and air suddenly becomes a, a, a site of political discussion and controversy. And they do so by expanding the repertoire of possible forms, objects, and sites of political action and participation. So that's one of the ways in which the same can unfold uh, 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 a new form of politics. The second one is about is, uh, is uh, speculating about political, and I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, movement. It's called tactical urbanism, and and they do different actions. They intervene in different cities. And oh, sorry, no, I pick this one. So that, what I mean by uh, speculating is the capacity of the same to unfold an otherwise of uh, uh, an otherwise society of political action and imagination. The example is tactical urbanism. So these guys, what they do is trying to reclaim public space, the use of public space, and, and they do so in different ways. So this is one action, and this is called open streets. So what they, did, what they did in this one is they block a street and they turn it into a yoga studio. So uh, the point was that is to just to uh, raise the question of what if this public space could be another thing? and to use that as a way of questioning the uses of public states. Now, uh, so they did that by destabilizing the problem that was unfolded. So this is a road, and this just serves a function, which is uh, for cars. And they say, well, what if it is not just the only possible use of it? I don't know if you know this one, this Walker your city, this was uh, May and uh, Raleigh, and what they did is to, it was plastered around the city in different, in different um, areas, uh, these signs that tell you how much uh, uh, it takes to get to one place by walking. And the idea was that 41% you know, of all the, uh, uh, what is it? Yeah, so 41% of uh, the uh, movement in car is for uh, uh, things that can, do, can, can be done in less than 20 minutes walking. So the idea was, okay, let's, let's show, let's unfold a scale of the city that normally uh, remains hidden, which is the pedestrian, yes. So this, this to me looks an awful lot like a nudge. Well, I will dispute that, but that in the Q&A. Uh, I, I, I will dispute that. Okay, so what they did is, uh, okay, so this is, uh, uh, I, what they're trying to do is to disclose, to unfold a, a scale of the city that remains hidden, which is the scale, the pedestrian scale which is one that we can see by actually showing that the city can be also a walkable space and not just a space that, can, that you have to drive. And this is another one that is called Parking Day. And what they, uh, what they have done, this has been really successful, so these people will occupy um, parts of the street and they uh, uh, create a park uh, in them. Uh, just to show that actually, well, you know, that these spaces can be used in, in different ways, and actually there's a lot of waste space as well. Now, so what I want to claim with this is that the political um, impact of this is that they don't, it doesn't reside in the capacity to actually unfold a new program, but actually the capacity to speculate with a given public space, like in a street, like a street, and unfold the possibility of an otherwise. So the point is that they offer the possibility of what if we could use this for another thing. Now, you can say that these are just rhetorical, playful, harmless gestures, and they don't amount to much, but as a matter of fact, some of them do. So uh, this is part of this, which is actually a direct translation of parking date. And, and you, can, you, you can see this in Portland, in Seattle, and in Philadelphia as well. So it's the same idea. So it's actually, the point of this is that they're not trying to solve anything. So it's not a, a, a problem that's been solved actually. They're trying to redefine public space. And this is one that is in front of a public library. So the public library has created this as a, as a way of gaining some public space. Would you say that the parklet is now taking something that was unfolded and has unfolded it now in a more yeah. legitimate way? Yeah. So this this is the possibility. Yeah. So this is the possibility that it opened. So what if we use the street in that way, and that was the, the potential? And this is let's do it. Okay. 
and and I know the, the one that the 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 the, 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 the signage project actually is being taken in Hoboken. So Hoboken is going to now use this as part of the official signage of the city uh, to put uh, all these um, uh, signs. And there are studies actually saying suggest that actually people do um, uh, walk more. And then the last one is experimental with political design. I hope I have time. Um, okay, so what I mean by this is the capacity of the sign to inform an experimental setting uh, in which it is possible to stage, to test, and to interrogate different political hypotheses and scenarios. So in this project, this one is, I'm gonna, the example is very dear to me, uh, and this is called the Jane Fonda Kid House. Uh, and the Jane Fonda Kid House um, is an experimental house. Um, it's an experimental prototype, and the point uh, was uh, to create uh, a house that was entirely self-sufficient, so entirely off the grid. So uh, all the energy of the house is produced through physical exercise. The, one of the things that, uh, that, that the house came with is a, a recipe book. So th that is a, a recipe for a risotto. You need this many people, you need uh, to exercise for this many hours, uh, you can, uh, so you want spaghetti, you can do this. So the, the, that's, that's, uh, the whole point is that physical, you have your so sufficient through your exercise. Now, the, 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 the point of this house is not to make a desirable model or even a plausible model. The, whole, the point of the house was to propose a political, uh, a polemical model. And the polemical is to seek to interrogate current discussions about sustainability. And in, in, I don't know if you're aware, but I mean most, in architecture, most uh, discussions about sustainability are about, uh, are about technology and design. So sustainability is a design problem. We don't need to change anything. The only thing that we need is to create better uh, devices or better homes that actually reduce energy consumption. So it's just a technological, technical problem. And the point of the house was to suggest that problem is not just a technological problem, probably is also a, a cultural and a political problem. And to do that, the, the, we define what we call the Jane Fonda model of citizenship. And by that we meant that in this house, the only possible citizen of this future would be Jane Fonda. So he's the only one that can exercise 24 hours and can be self-sufficient. Uh, so the rest of us actually would probably not fit into that kind of um, scenario, right? So the idea, uh, the, the point is that the ideal citizen is the one who can satisfy all the energy needs through the bodily, uh, through the bodily um, exercise. I don't know if you see anything there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so the, the point is that uh, it was a way, a way of questioning things that are not included in these discussions about uh, sustainability as a technological problem. So a question like, for example, what, are, what kind of citizens, bodies, and new practices are imagined to fulfill the promises of sustainable futures, which normally require a lot of exercise, although that is never uh, explicitly said? Or what kind of infrastructure are required to produce those citizens? And, what, and which citizens and bodies and, um, and practices are excluded from participating, participating in those futures. For example, disability is not, uh, uh, doesn't enter into the picture of most of these uh, sustainable discourses. I'm finished. So, yeah? <laughs> yeah? I, two, two minutes. <laughs> okay. So, then so just to wrap up. Uh, so, what does unfolding do? So, the point is. Uh, the point is that it transforms design into a mechanism to generate political questions and, and problems. And another way of putting it is that design is not just um, uh, a practice that uh, answers political questions that have been posed elsewhere, but it can be a practice that raises questions that have to be resolved politically. Now, the concluding thought, just not to make you angry, uh, is that so? I'm, what I'm not suggesting is that uh, you know if uh, and folders burn in hell and and the, and the folders are the good guys who uh, who go to hell. So what I'm, I'm trying to suggest is that and folder and folder are two different modes in which design can manage political. <coughs> and and not only that is that and folder and folder particularly different political forms and practices. So the question for me is which one you take. I mean if you. Uh, to unfold it is that do you solve or do you see? I mean, do you want to to solve? Do you want to problematize? Do you want to shrink the political? Do you want to enlarge the political? Do you want a pacification of the political? Or do you want to uh, 
create an agonistic space for the body to converge? Do you want to prescribe or do you want to propose? Or do you want passive citizens or do you want active citizenship? So it's two different ways, two different uh, modes in which design can matter politically. And it's up to the designer to uh, choose one or the other. The only thing that I think that you cannot do is to pretend that there are no politics in the site and not to choose any of them. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. So just so you don't have one hour of continuous back to back, uh, I wanted to maybe offer five minutes for okay. cl clarification kinds okay. of questions for Fernando's talk. And mine will be having a few things. So, uh, well, so I I ask a few questions, and then there'll be more time for discussion across our talks. Yes. So most of the examples of the um, unfolding were to promote sort of political discussions and debates that I think we're sympathetic to. But how would you imagine? I don't know, like propaganda or Nazi, you know, something that would be also Nazi bringing things into Nazi. yeah, having it Nazi right away. <laughs> but you know what I mean? How? Uh, those could also be political debates and orientations, but could this design approach, this mode of design, still be used for? Okay, so I think that that's, that's that would be beside the point. I mean, the point would be to, uh, I mean, to basically open up a practice that raises questions no matter who they are. And and I think that well, I didn't have enough time to explain the day for the kid house uh, in detail, but that house was uh, designed to be ambivalent. So it didn't promote, so it showed the good things that can happen if you uh, uh, approach sustainability from a technological point of view, and the bad things, and it tried to be agnostic. So the point would be to raise the question rather than try, trying to solve uh, the questions. And what you're trying to say is that... Uh, well, I guess I'm just saying, like, I think it'd be interesting to see some examples where the questions raised are uncomfortable to our political orientation. You know, could could you imagine somebody doing this to like try to create uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt? Fear, certainty, and doubt about <laughs> immigration. <laughs> about yeah. other, you know, I, I mean, strikes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, relevant I just, topic. I just would be curious to see that play out. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, I think that that's something that, that, that is contained as a possibility in this kind of approach, in this kind of action. You cannot control that. I mean, it's something that lends itself to that kind of um, take. So you set up the enfolding and unfolding as kind of antonyms. Kind of. And I wonder if they better fit as being orthogonal rather than uh, opposed. Because, so I was thinking about the, and, and I'm really curious to hear your answer about, is the walk rally a nudge as opposed to an unfolding? And my sense is that to the extent that people see those signs and think differently, that they realize new possibilities, it's an unfolding. To the extent that they then walk to the shipyard, it's an enfolding. And so the same sign could do both. And so for that reason, I kind of see them as orthogonal. Yeah, so that's, I, I, I entirely agree with you. And it's the same with the monitors, uh, with the energy monitors. Uh, so they can criticize as well for being for playing with the unconscious of people so is that you tend to restrict your energy when you have a device that is red blinking in your kitchen, right? Uh, the, the, but there are two different ways of uh, seeing them. They can work in, in, in both ways. If what they do is to raise the question and open up the possibility of you acting in one way or another, then that's the point of the device. That would be unfolding. So it's like it's raising the question to the citizen. It's like what do you want to do? If you want to go, you want to, you, what you want to do is to encode the practice and the decision of the citizen in the design, that's the unfolding um, part of it. But I don't think that they are contradictory, and I think that the uh, parking bay and parklets is the best example, is that this guy said, hey, look, all this waste space that we have in the city, we could use it for uh, creating a park. And then the city council of different um, cities said, well, that's a good idea. So actually, they are now designing a, a, a space that is meant to be used in a specific way as a public space. So uh, that's a, 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 a problem of um, order. So which one comes first and second? So I think that it's more complicated than just as answers. 
that's probably just for the sake of race and maybe making a bit of discussion. But then if the religious part might as well be there. Maybe we can yeah. transition to the next talk and then I'll have to introduce yourself. You want to introduce me? Yeah, I'll introduce myself. There's a reason why uh, I paired my talk up with Fernando's. So, um, yeah, as I mentioned before, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Communication, and today I'm going to be talking about a project that I've been working on for since 2009, so for five years, with Six Silverman, a PhD student in informatics at UC Irvine, uh, as well as a large number of mechanical Turk workers. Uh, so, the project I'm going to be talking to you about is called Turkopticon, and it's uh, an intervention into a large digital labor crowdsourcing system called Amazon Mechanical Turk. And uh, the intervention is to build a forum that allows workers to review employers and figure out which employers are scammy. Um, so I list as collaborators the people, the workers who moderate the forum, as well as the workers who actually provide content to the forum. Um, for those of you who have seen me talk about this before, there is a new part at the end. <laughs> 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 Until then, you can just nod along. So, um, in, the, in this talk, I'm going to start by arguing the Mechanical Turk, uh, is this, which I'll explain more about what that is, is a system that organizes human workers as a form of computational infrastructure to be used by computer science professionals um, and often academic experimenters as a convenient way of getting data. Um, so that's one kind of that's one force of organizing people in a form for the pleasure of some other people. But then a counter, I want to argue that design, in this case through Tricopticon, can act as a counter force to help workers demand recognition as people, not only as computational power. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about the kind of trouble that I, I and my collaborator had with Amazon Mechanical Turk that led us to design this intervention. Uh, I'll talk about the working conditions of being human infrastructure, and then the design of the system, of you know, this Tricopticon system. And then I'm going to speak a bit about some of the ambivalences of being somewhat successful in, in that endeavor, and building a system that a lot of workers use, and building a system that actually has intervened in the broader computer science and media discourse about crowdsourcing. Um, and that's going to be one of the ways I want us to think about the politics of design, not only through intervention, but also about us coming in as designers <laughs> and changing the conversation. So to start, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's Amazon Mechanical Turk is basically a website that Amazon runs that lets people who have large amounts of data processing tasks, like you have 1,000 images of lamps, and you need to know whether they're <laughs> gray lamps, pink lamps, blue lamps, modern looking lamps, cute lamps, ugly lamps, so you can organize them on your website. Or you have a website where people are uploading family photos, but every so often something inappropriate or offensive might slip through and you need to find those and filter those. Those are kinds of problems that I call cultural data processing. They're really hard for artificial intelligence algorithms to do, or machine learning algorithms to do. So Amazon had a large number of these kinds of computational problems, and they designed Mechanical Turk as a place where they could put all these data processing tasks uh, put a price for, you know, if you label this image, I'll give you a penny or five cents or 25 cents. Um, and then workers all over the world who could access Amazon's website, get paid in dollars, get paid in rupees, or get paid in Amazon gift certificates, could come and become data processing workers from their home with the computing infrastructures they already have. Um, then Amazon took that system that they built and they made it publicly accessible to people in the United States. So. And this is a picture of a kind of co-work space of programmers who could then could now access this job pool, um, write lines of code that can put a bunch of data out there for people to process and then automatically transfer the payment. So when we when I first became Amazon Mechanical Turk in 2008, the dialogue was uh, pretty dichotomous. Amazon Mechanical Turk either empowers workers because it makes work available anywhere to people who choose to do it. One to two dollars is a good income for people in developing economies, as that argument went. This argument was particularly in, it was primarily in the technological media, although New York Times covered it as well. Um, workers are free to work where they want. You can't coerce someone across the screen, was the story. Um, and this was kind of the dominant publicly visible conversation. 
The other side of it, a mostly limited to sort of cynical academics, political economists, communication scholars like Trevor Schultz and maybe a fledgling me, uh, was that Amazon exploits workers. One to two dollars an hour is not enough money. This makes low paid work even more precarious because instead of having a temp shift for eight hours, now you have a temp shift for five seconds and then you have to go look for the next job. So it seemed exploitative to me. Oh, yeah, Amazon Amazon exploiting them or the employers? that are work, employing people through Amazon? Uh, Amazon is not that That's important. a good question. So in this, I was actually only trying to characterize where the debate was at the time, because one of the things I want to argue is that we don't, nobody, we don't really know the answer, and it also depends on your definition of exploitation. So um, with, with that in mind, one of the voices that was not included in those debates at all were the voices of the workers who were actually doing this work. What kinds of opportunities, what kinds of pleasures, what kinds of vulnerabilities did this mode of work create for them? Six and I were not trick workers, and so we, our first step was actually to try to do something like to take, have the ethnographic impulse, but how do you do that when people are distributed across tens of thousands of homes? So we made a survey that we put on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Now, it wasn't supposed to be a scientific survey. I actually put a question, if you could have a tricker, Tricker is the kind of member category term for worker uh, in Turk. If you could have a Tricker Bill of Rights, what would you want that Bill of Rights to be? So the survey was more an invitation to speculate about what, a better, working, what better working conditions in Amazon Mechanical Turk were, or could be, sorry. So a large number of workers talked about unfair or arbitrary rejections. A large number talked about getting paid really slowly. Um, it turns out that a lot of workers use this as a kind of stopgap wage, like they have other jobs and they use this to make the rent at the end of the month. And so even though 30 days might seem like nothing to the researcher who's paying workers through Mechanical Turk, you know, two days is too long for some of the workers who are trying to make their money. Um, a smaller number of workers, but still, you know, it was a common theme where it said that Amazon's really unresponsive and employers are unresponsive when an issue happens. When the work gets rejected, this, the work, workers say that they don't have anything, anybody to complain to, there's no mediation. And the some said that there's no minimum wage. So our, take, our takeaway here, as people exploring this space, was that actually what a better form of crowdsourcing would be is not at all clear and not at all agreed on. So some workers would say, I want a union for working on this system. Others were like, no unions, I really identify as being a freelancer. So what do you do when there's disagreement? There's not a kind of, these are the users and we have represented them as designers and now we can design for those users that is, conven that is convenient or ethical to do here. So um, what, we, what we did was sort of focus on some of the common problems that we saw. This arbitrary rejections, not getting paid quickly, not even having a way of communicating that back. But it turns out that the problem of communication in the Mechanical Turk platform is actually is a feature of the system, not a bug. Like Mechanical Turk lets a programmer hire 20,000 people for two days to do a whole bunch of data processing, <laughs> or you know, 10,000 people on an ongoing basis to process data that's coming into their servers made through API calls. So having a mediation process where a worker emails and says, hey, I don't know why you rejected me, or I think your pay should be higher, or even, hey, your task design is really confusing, and I think you're getting a lot of erroneous inputs from workers. Those kinds of social interactions do not scale. So I also, I also was going to some crowdsourcing meetups, talking to requesters during this time, and one of them just explained it as, you can't spend time exchanging mail. The time you spent looking at email costs you more than what you paid them. This has to function on autopilot as an algorithmic process and integrated with your business processes. So the automation of hiring and firing and managing people, of rejecting the work that looks like spam and accepting the work that looks good and processing payment, in some sense has to be black boxed into the algorithm because of the scale of the employment that is happening here. That's kind of the feature of Mechanical Turk. That's the selling point, that it makes workers into a scalable infrastructure that hums along, much like a computation and that a community is borrowing from the STARS definition of infrastructure with Rula Vera uh, undergirds a community uh, that has shared practices built upon the assumptions that this infrastructure keeps going. So 
So in 2006, when Jeff Bezos was announcing Mechanical Turk at MIT, can you keep time for me, actually? It's okay, I think, okay, I have time. I'm sorry, never mind, I know when I start. Um, in 2006, when Jeff uh, Bezos announced this at MIT, he actually sold putting people into code as the thing that makes Mechanical Turk a, val a, a really valuable service. So here you have this pseudo code, you know, where while your product, you know, if you, when you get a photo, but if that photo contains a human, well, how do you know it contains a human? Well, you call Mechanical Turk, and you invoke this task, human in a picture, you pass the photo that you want to process in, and you set the price, two cents. And then if the answer comes back from the person on the other end who's doing this data work, it contains a human, then accept the photo. Otherwise, reject the photo. So the whole point of having this code is that you're not managing it on a case-by-case basis. Um, so, given, given the scenario where the value add of Turk is to have workers humming along as a kind of quiet infrastructure, uh, we have the question of how to proceed, and how to proceed on some of the issues that workers have highlighted that they are facing in this workplace. So, our, our approach was to build, on al to build alliances, rather than trying to characterize the condition of workers, by identifying points of common cause. And so here we're following in our case, we were following feminist theorists like Donna Haraway, who, who has feminism, has long dealt with this situation of how do you achieve some kind of social or cultural progress while also accounting for the politics and the power relations of very diverse people that you can't kind of categorize with analytical categories with any kind of precision. So I found feminism, feminist theory very practical for design. <laughs> um, we wanted to promote a, a debate about ethics of human computation. So this kind of goes to some of what Fernando was talking about, although I did not know Fernando until this year, of, well, we want, Mechanical Turk was sort of enfolding management political questions about how digital laborers work for programmers, and we wanted to open that back up so that those debates and those political decisions became visible again as subject to conversation to resistance. Um, we wanted to force changes in employer practices in what small and practical ways we could. And uh, we wanted to ourselves learn more deeply about these issues. So in some sense, this engagement of building and designing Tricoptocon, more for me than for Six, because Six is really interested in economics. But for me, trained in ethnography, is a form of participant observation, is a form of situated engagement through which I am generating cultural data about encounters. So I saw this as a kind of anthropological practice, although most anthropologists don't build systems and then write about them. So what we ended up doing was uh, building Tricopticon, which is an attempt to reconfigure the optics of how the system works. So, the way Tricopticon works in brief is that uh, on the Amazon Mechanical Turk task market, you have a list of these tasks. Like uh, there's a requester called product search, maybe they have uh, some kind of labeling task they want you to do or a survey. There will be a price for it. And so workers will look at a list of, there's many, many pages of these tasks. And the workers will be trying to figure out, well, do I work for this requester? Do I work for that requester? How do I know if this guy is reputable, if he'll actually pay up, or reject my work arbitrarily? So uh, Turkopticon ha uh, is a browser extension, <coughs> so the worker can install it in their browser. Then when they go to Mechanical Turk's task website, uh, we read the HTML code of the page and look for the identification numbers that are embedded in the HTML code. We pull out that identification number, and then we ask our database, do we have any reviews for a requester that has that identification number written by other workers at some other time? Uh, we basically present, we present an average of those reviews, uh, and then we also have a link so people can actually read the open-ended comments. Um, and so that if someone clicks to read the open-ended comments, they can actually see the review. They can see the review details. Um, these are reviews for different requesters, but you would, you, they would, if they click this, they would see reviews. All the reviews individual workers have written of that requester, and they would see open-ended comments that workers have written to explain. Uh, this was a compromise that we had to make because I'm not quantifying here because I believe that the quality of an employment relationship is actually quantifiable um, as you know a black box knowledge object. I'm quantifying because workers have to look at 
hundreds of employers and make decisions about them pretty quickly, and they're probably doing this, in many cases they're doing this because they need the money, so having them go read the comments for everybody just doesn't do them a service. <laughs> so um, what ends up happening is if the requester has really good, so we call that tactical quantification in our CHI paper, where we're sort of taking a, respecting feminist STS insights about the constructiveness of knowledge and the political nature of it, but also respecting the kind of lived temporal pressures of being a worker. But then we make, but we also want to encourage discussion, and so we have the open-ended reviews, and although it's not in the screenshot, oh, here, and workers can also comment, they ha argue, like, is that really fair to expect, or, you know, I didn't have that experience. Um, so, this screenshot is from the Turkopticon website. This screenshot is from the Amazon Mechanical Turk website with our tool inserting the reviews in it. Do you have questions? Anyone have questions about that? I see some kind of puzzled stares, but the text is very small. I apologize. <laughs> OK. OK, and then, so when I first kind of sheepishly told someone I knew, that I, there's somebody I knew was the CEO of a crowdsourcing company. And uh, he's a friend of a friend. And I, when I told him about this project, I felt really like it was going to be very socially awkward. <laughs> hey, I'm cr criticizing your industry. Um, and he actually read this as, oh no, this is leveling the this is leveling the information playing field. This is important for a well-functioning market. And I thought, well, that's interesting because I don't think that this tool can ever level the playing field. People are coming in with really def different levels of economic vulnerability. But it's interesting that the CEO reads it that way. Um, and so to further drive our point home, we also tried to have, we had a provocative <laughs> homepage where you came in to install the tool or learn what it was. Like We had um, this classified ad, help wanted, $1.20 an hour, risk of repetitive stress injury, no care for on-the-job injuries, no guaranteed minimum wage, no guarantee of payment, mechanical turf industries. Um, or I have, I'm not a graphic designer, but I made this dot matrix, like, hand-drawn dot matrix font. <laughs> um, so the point of this was not to, it was to carve out an, a kind of adversarial position to provoke debate about crowdsourcing, because we didn't want this to feel like, oh, this is the solution, someone is taking care of it, fantastic. No, there's lots of other issues workers will face that we can't do anything about. So, um, by some measures, these are our Google Analytics, we are, success we are successful. Like, we are living the dream of homegrown user-centered design in that lots of people use it. This is 20,000 unique visitors um, per month. I think I took this in November. Uh, lots of page views. Hooray! <laughs> um, and in some, so in, in becoming something that workers actually use, day to day, providing reviews to one another, discussing their employment conditions. We hope that this is an infrastructure that allows workers to provide mutual aid to one another. It also was successful in changing or provoking different kinds of coverage on worker issues. So there are articles on Mechanical Turk in Sacramento, over the, over the last five years, Sacramento Bee, O'Reilly Radar, Public Radio, both in the US and abroad, The Nation, The Verge. So these, these were articles that, when they sought to cover Mechanical Turk, especially the earlier ones, they were going out to cover this new form of work, but then now there's something on the web that sits there and says, hey, you know what, there's real questions to ask about this source, about this kind of work. So I can't go and talk to every journalist, but I can make a website that catches somebody's attention, and then they come and they you know, want to get a quote or want to learn more about these conditions. So it was successful also as a way of sort of changing the changing the political conversation in some measure. Um, but six years later, Amazon still doesn't offer workers any more protections than it did before. Uh, it, they don't mention Tricopticon, but it seems like they kind of rely on Tricopticon. Uh, and one, one other crowdsourcing firm has recently introduced worker ratings of its tasks into its own system. Uh, so maybe there's the influence there, who knows. Um, yeah, Amazon largely has not paid attention, perhaps for even legitimizing Mechanical Turk by making it more tolerable for workers who are working on Amazon's version of the crowdsourcing system. But, so at this juncture, so, 
success here is not really a success for the larger problem of the conditions of these digital workers, right? And I wanted to focus in now on one particular part of what this success has meant that might have lessons or provocations for us as designers. So this is the section, the new stuff for those of you who've seen this part, and it's uh, on designing change or the problem of being the design savior. Uh, specifically, we're seeing a lot of promises being made about design creating new conditions of poverty alleviation, new forms of education, uh, de economic development for countries, uh, and so I'm here to talk to you about one very concrete story about what happens when you try to intervene and help <laughs> and the problems that can come from it. So I'll start this argument by talking about the way trickers have been represented in the media conventionally. Um, as part of being a great infrastructure form of labor, their labor is devalued, it's considered a rote, and that's why people feel justified in part in paying them very little money because they figure, oh, they must not have other skills if they're resorting to this work. So back in 2006, a Wired writer had a blog and a book uh, and a kind of landmark article on crowdsourcing. Jeff Howe used this image of an ape sitting at a computer taking out tasks to talk about, to illustrate a metaphorical form for truckers. Or an MIT website around 2010 put workers on a silicon chip, you know, multicolored because they're global, but chips don't fight back. Chips don't generate new works of art, usually, unless you're one of those art AI people. Um, you know, chips process the things that you need processed. They're a tool to empower you. So this was the dominant, this was the kind of the dominant public media image. At the same time, we're not the only ones who are letting trickers communicate with one another. There are also uh, worker-run forums. Trucker Nation, Cloudly maybe, that have run for many years. Uh, this is like PHP forum, the software has been written, it's like pretty uh, robust, but it takes a lot of time to moderate one of these forums. Thousands of people use at least this forum, I'm not sure what their numbers are. There's a lot of moderation work, a lot of norm setting, a lot of uh, work that workers do to bring employers in and get them to communicate with workers here in a more in-depth way. So Turkers are not just docile chip processors, they're actually doing organizing work themselves, they're using technology in important and meaningful ways that are making an impact in their kind of ecology of mutual aid. Turkopticon is one piece of that ecology. But reading the news, you wouldn't see that. <laughs> reading the news, you would see that, you know, Turkopticon is Union 2.0, this is a Verge article, so they cover the high-tech industries, they cover innovation, entrepreneurship, we're Union 2.0. Or this Nation article portrays crowd workers as ghosts in the digital machine, and then they quote us as, pe as people who are sort of recognizable as activists trying to provoke workers to recognize their rights and re recognize their alienation. Um, there are other articles that are like this, but I just wanted to use these as examples. Um, so within these broader communities, like Trucker Nation and Cloudy Baby, like we've been in contact with them over the years, but then. Uh, they get pissed, right? Because these articles are making us saviors and making them dopes. <laughs> we're saviors because we made a browser extension and made some kind of new code and we're located in an institution of higher education and so we have this sort of cultural capital to be recognized as innovators. We make a good human interest story. We're pushing the progress of technology forward, all that good stuff. Workers are taking technology that's already developed, so no story there, and they're doing largely devalued communicative labor, labor that's not particularly well paid in the internet industries, like customer support workers get, uh, get celebrated much less than programmers in those industries, and the same applies here. So the point I wanna make here is that for Six and I, being recognizable as the designers on the scene made it easy to, for journalists to tell a story of high tech has created this problem and look, high tech is solving it, hooray. And it's workers that pointed out the, the problem of this kind of representation to us and that, that, it, that it was happening. Um, so I kind of already discussed, so I kind of discussed sort of the states of this, but I want to make, so the point is that design is a social category. Design is not just any kind of making. Tinkerers aren't designers, craftspeople, are not identified as designers typically. Now, designing 
people often do say design is any of these things. Like when Don spoke, he said, oh, designers can be anything from hair design to floral design to, to building a new technology. But in practice, when you look at who actually gets called a designer, who's identified as a designer, who gets funding to go be a catalyst for change from the Gates Foundation, it's not the people that fit in this wide, expanse definition of design. It's people who have cultural capital, symbolic capital, financial capital, uh, education, uh, to be legible as designers. So, to conclude, I want to reflect on this issue, question of what, do, what are the politics of doing design? I mean, one is that we've built a system that fits into a media ecology, and we do allow workers to conveniently provide mutual aid to each other. Granted, so we're media practitioners, the workers are also media practitioners in their forums. But by being the designers on the scene, we can make these mediagenic interventions that both take issue with crowdsourcing and kind of make it into a public issue. But by making it a public issue, we also, in some ways, perpetuated part of the, part of the problem, which is this uh, erasure of worker skill and agency uh, as part of the kind of history of technology and, you know, tech, uh, and economics of technology as a kind of high value contributor to that. So with that, I want to thank you and then open it up to questions for both of us are discussion among you. of both your talks, what are your thoughts on some of the new DIY communities that are emerging for integrating the physical and computational worlds like Airbnb, Lyft, Uber, Etsy, things like that? Now, do you know your thoughts? Can I ask you a clarifying question? So you mentioned Airbnb and Uber and um, also Etsy. So, but then you also said DIY. Like, do you see those three things all as DIY? Well, I mean, I think there's an interesting set of stuff that has emerged in the past couple of years that has the flavor of either new market for people to be able to make things and share it with them. People have something, mm -hmm. be it uh, an object or a skill. Mm -hmm. And there are new markets for connecting that resource availability with people who are interested in that, whether that's a ride from here to there, uh, or you know, a, a new tracksuit of some kind, mm -hmm. and it, I mean, it, it just seems that seems like an area worthy of analysis. I don't have thoughts beyond that, other than it seems interesting. Actually, have thoughts on that either. I might. Have. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you want to? Wait, you don't have thoughts, but do you have thoughts? I don't want to cut you off. Well, the only th the only thing that I that I can think of is that. Uh, is, is how can those things get shaped? Uh, I mean, you have different, I mean, you have only a, a similarity in terms of the kind of things. There's people who have things and you can put them together and share them. But then there's a kind of platform through which that um, happens. Airbnb is different from Etsy, Etsy is different from Uber. And so, the, I mean, then is how then it, how the design of those communities uh, gets in place to, to be what they are, right? So that, that would be the question. And I do think that a lot of these social computing platforms get appropriated in ways that the designers never intended. But that's I mean, always the case. That's always the case, absolutely. And so the question is, is there, is there something new to say about this genre, or is it just like all the other stuff? I think that it, I'll just say it's just like all the other stuff. But, um, so I think to me the question is, what well, these, pl these platforms that are designed to make new kinds of things into resources that can be bought or sold or shared, like who's building the platform that shapes that thing that can be bought, sold, or shared, and then who realizes the value of that? 
Um, and what is the nature of the relationship? Yeah. Because I mean, if it's just uh, an extension of commodification of relationships, then you have just a very old story. So I feel like so. calling it DIY is a way of saying, uh, or, or participatory is a way of saying, oh, you get to participate in the production of value, but people always have participated in the production of value. So like, uh, with Michael Bernstein and Yudufar, we were having a meeting one day and we thought of the question, why don't work, if, if mechanical Turk is so a general purpose, why don't workers ever use mechanical Turk for their own purposes? Like this infrastructure is created to make certain kinds of labor possible and circulable, but these are those kinds of labor are not useful for workers to buy, probably even if they could afford them. So the designer of the platform has a lot of power to make certain kinds of labor or product available. Does that, does that sort of make, uh, so I guess that, that's a heuristic, like, um, yeah, like who can actually use the product? And do the producers tend to also be the consumers? Like if it's really uneven, then that's, a, that's probably a, a sign of some kind of closer to extractive relationship that's happening, right? I also wonder if there's the, by being kind of platform in the middle to let these two different parties, you know, the buyers and sellers come together, uh, which tends to get treated as neutral. I feel like it's a really strong power position, uh, in part because say you're doing Lyft or something like that, mm -hmm. I imagine that a big part of your business depends on developing a good reputation, on Lyft and so forth, but what if suddenly they start charging more? It's not like I can switch taxi companies. You know what I mean? Like how do you bring your reputation and all those reviews and things like that that might be a big part of your asset with you? Can you actually move those across to a different platform? The same way that you know you kind of get locked into Facebook and it's like, well, that's where all my friends' comments were and things like that, so I'm kind of stuck there. So and another thing that um, you reminded me of is, so by calling it a platform, the other thing that's accomplished, and this is an argument that Charlton Gillespie makes in the politics of platforms is that the company says, oh, well, we're just a platform. People are empowered to produce their own stuff in it, but so we're not legally responsible for it unless you really make it. So they try to make arguments that by being the platform, they, can ca they, they should be paid something, but they also should be responsible for the things that happen on top because it's open-ended and like, that's one of the things or that we're selling. the new Michael Lewis book about the stock exchanges and the way that they're partly making money by selling brokers space in their buildings to be closer to the exchange. So it comes across as like, we're just this neutral marketplace. And you know, grocery stores and stuff like that have been doing that for years too. Like we'll charge you the seller the good to have a better space than Walmart or wherever. Um, but you know, it appears like it's just this neutral marketplace or store that they're actually uh, exercise a lot of power. Mm -hmm. Has anybody question. ever done one of these as a co-op? The what? Oh, like crowdsourcing or? or yeah, is there a co-op Turk? No, I've never seen it. Um, Six Silverman and Gilbert Bernstein at Stanford have both talked about it, but uh, no one has had the time paid to eat to do it. <laughs> I think it's a great idea to try it. I think it'd be interesting. So I have a question for you. I, I think there's one that relates. I mean, in particular, one of the things that you hear like, all the time complaining about is that uh, what happens with your buildings is not what they intended to in the first place. Uh, and I think, I, I think your, your, your talk was a version of that in a sense, mm -hmm. is that, uh, I mean, is, is this, I don't know what was the word, is it? I mean, not to acknowledge the, 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 the limitations that you have as a design, mm -hmm. but because you intended this to do something, but then you feel ambivalent mm -hmm. because it hasn't, it hasn't accomplished much or much of what you would have liked it to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And but that's probably as much as you can. Yeah, it's not surprising that, yeah. it's, it's only disappointing, not surprising, that Amazon yeah. hasn't changed its practices. Good. Yeah, so that's, I mean, it was something that I mean, is that this, this I mean, is, I think that when we're going to talk is this idea of the <coughs> performance evolution is that, well, I mean, if I design something very good, mm -hmm. then things will follow. Mm -hmm. And then they, things don't follow, and then they feel really disappointed by it. But it's, I mean, it's, it's the nature of, uh, uh, I mean, yeah. it's that, that was my focus of, of accepting the limitations. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't, I don't want the talk to be like, this is a failure. I, I just wanted to, so in addition to the thing about these interventions don't get taken up the way you expect. I also wanted to add the dimension of our positionality 
as the people who claim to be the authors of those interventions and how those also become part of how the intervention is taken up and interpreted in ways that we don't, uh, in ways that we don't hope. But I mean, in the sense that it did change the dialogue, I feel like yeah. it is, it has been an unfolding device. Yeah. And I feel okay about that. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Oh, one of the things that like fascinates me about the sort of unfolding, um, unfolding, unfolding, is I mean, is how it's sort of like I mean, they seem incredibly mutually reliant. Like when you were talking, I was thinking about you know a friend of mine who um, did her her project in Adonia um, on the on the Ciclovia in L.A. and essentially helped start you know this open streets event <coughs> as a sort of like way to see the streets in this liberatory way. Now, what's ended up happening as it's become more popular and the mayor's become behind it is now it's also become a tool for gentrification, mm -hmm. which is exactly the opposite of what she wanted it to do. And yeah. so it's sort of, you know. I was going to use critical mass in the case of example. But that's, it, 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 that's the thing. I mean, that's the thing. But, but again, I mean, it's, it's about recognizing the. It's not about solving the world, it's mm -hmm. that you're raising an issue and that you're actually pretty powerless as to what comes out after you raise the question. Mm -hmm. And, and your power is limited to, if you're lucky, to raise the question and to make it into a public uh, question, a, a, a debate. And then how it is then, I don't know, what, if for example, with the walking signage that Hoboken is doing, I mean, probably they're going to use it for, you know, revitalizing parts of the city to make it more walkable, more attractive. They're probably, there's going to be probably real estate interest in, in those signage. I don't know. I mean, the question, what they did in the first place is that, you know, the city is also, or can also be a walkable space. And that kind of pedestrian scale is something that was seen what they were trying to, you know, raise. That's what they did. Now, what happens next is... But is it, in making a... Oh, sorry. I can. Well, there were two questions. I don't know. I'll wait. Okay, Bill. Oh, I was going to say that... I think that this is the, the first half of the talk of the aesthetic, but the, the interreliance that there's really a dialectical structure to what you're talking about. So think about the Kantian dialectic or even how it gets used in Marxism. You can start to see that there that interreliance is, is I think of it as a larger process, that it's now not a design process where I design the artifact, but in some sense the the, the whole thing is being designed all the time. And sort of this, uh, what's the dialectical structure? Hypothesis, antithesis, synthesis. Right. So that's sort of a, a structure, and we sort of take that as a maybe a. Yeah, I think you said this as a normal, normal, normal way that business is conducted. Well, for me, more than dialectic, I would, I would prefer anachronistic in the sense that, for example, one of the things that uh, you can see how they feed each other is. Uh, so something gets unfolded and then is absent from public discussion because the problem has been solved. And then when, when that problem has been settled, is when uh, that creates actually the conditions for unfolding, is that now we have to, oh, wait a minute, this is not uh, solved for me or for my group or for my interest. So then is when you create actually this, the, the space for the unfolding of that problem, exactly. and that gets unfolded, and then it gets into the public debate, and then it gets uh, again settled, and then again that creates a, this was actually a false closure of the uh, of the polemic. Then the people that look at these are things that uh, haven't been uh, settled, and you know, so it's that kind of process of going to and fro that is actually created actually uh, basically the public sphere. As an agonistic uh, exchange between these processes of unfolding and unfolding. Jacob, you had your hand up a yeah. while ago. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't think you should beat up on yourself at all about not creating a revolution <laughs> um, in among Turkers. I guess both of your talks make me think, uh, well, that there's still, when you talk about design, even if it's to open up spaces, it's still there's still some source or some kind of agency, right, to, to begin with, a designer. I just, I wonder, um, as a, again, maybe this question is too simplistic or too open, but what happens if you think about, I mean, if you're interested in making change as a designer, what happens if you apply the, the question of design kind of as a historical exercise to, like, say, the, um, the civil rights movement? 
would you, in, in this country, do you find, is there a way to, in terms of a model, I guess, is there a way to think about this success in Syria as, as having design in it? Well, I haven't designed, I mean, in terms of the logic of the that would be exactly the kind of example that I was trying to get at, in the sense that you have uh, an issue which is civil rights, which is set historically. Okay, so these are the guys who have rights. And then there is actually a group of people who actually say, wait a minute, let's actually unfold this as a problem by raising the issue that not everybody uh, that uh, should have rights has rights. But that was a problem that was set, you know, you know, you know. So actually the political activity is that problem, I mean, that activity of then unfolding it, putting it again into, uh, into the table uh, for discussion. I don't know if design has uh, something to do with it as a sign, but it's that kind of logic of uh, uh, closing off uh, uh, debates and open them up again as one of the questions. So it seems to me like when you talk about design as something that can unfold and unfold, design is actually only one thing yeah. that can do that. Yeah. And for you, design. My reading of your talk is that design is about um, material interventions that explicitly play with form and space as opposed to just language, which is maybe how you would be used to thinking about the public sphere. Yeah. But you don't mean design in the sort of user-centered design process or what's the nice, what's the thing that is appropriate for the people, user groups that are defined as having this need or that kind of thing. So, uh, so, the, the so then, this, you would never tell the history of a social movement as a history of design, because yeah. design is only one of the things that matters, yeah. <laughs> or in material intervention is only one of the things that matter. So I have to cut off like 20 slides uh, before <laughs> coming. And the, the 20 slides were, uh, I don't know if you know the name of uh, Jacques uh, Ancia, a uh, uh, French philosopher. And uh, what he uh, suggests or is that why don't we think of politics as aesthetics? And by thinking of politics as aesthetics, he doesn't mean to think politics in terms of art. He thinks of aesthetics as uh, what he calls the division of the sensible. What is visible? What can be heard? What can be seen? And he says that political activity actually is the management of what can be heard, what can be seen, and what counts. Uh, now, there are many ways in which uh, that can be negotiated. One practice is the sign. So one of the places in which uh, what is rendered visible and visible, heard and heard, what counts and what doesn't count, one practice of the many that we have is the sign. So the sign is always a political business because it always distributes what counts, what can be seen, what, can be, what, what is left uh, you know, as infrastructure. So that's one of the, 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 the practices that constitute the political. Mm -hmm. Not the only one, probably not even the most important one, mm -hmm. but it's one of them. I actually think it's incredibly dangerous to cast larger scale historical changes as design because it focuses so much on the agency of individuals with plans that are implemented and, <laughs> and which, which fail. I mean that's too that's much like, of that already. <laughs> yeah and that's, that was how was my own idea is that I'm gonna do social change through this new set of avenues. Thank God for concrete. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um so if things are I know Fernando you like debate so I don't think this is being no, I know you Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I just get this sense. I mean, I really like the unfolding and unfolding. <clears throat> but I feel like there's really something missing there. And it might be something that's in Lily's talk. And I think it's about this um, this need to kind of position who's doing the unfolding and yeah. unfolding. And I thought about it with this gentrification comment uh, or story. Because it seems to me that. So say this catches on and people are like, I'm now going to be a socially conscious designer who does practices in mode of design and it's called unfolding. Is this going to be like the Gap, you know, red campaign, which is making something visible that wasn't, but it becomes kind of a symbol of like showing your class status or, you know, even a more extreme version of that where you have like celebrities, you know, making something visible. Uh, and I guess where I'd like to see a little more attention and is kind of into the relations of like who's not in that public sphere and also kind of more how would something like this be maybe brought into conversation with like participatory design yeah, or so right you know just so it doesn't become this free floating mode that those of us who are already privileged and able to partake in the public sphere can like exercise this mode and show that we're 
progressive and hip and stylish and socially conscious. You know what I mean? And I think Lily's getting at that in her relationship. Yeah. So, I mean, that's for example a huge, yeah. that's, that's been a huge debate in architecture for a long time because I'm just, one of the, the things that I'm just have trying to do is to face themselves. I mean, critical architects is that it's not me deciding this, it's the community, and, and they always fail. Uh, so, participation is the largest biggest red herring in architecture ever. I mean, normally in the end, uh, participatory architectural design uh, boils down to uh, handing out a couple of uh, uh, questionnaires and, or talking to the representative of the community who actually becomes right. a stakeholder and the one who has the power to speak on behalf of. And so it, it, it does an incredibly um, complex debate. and. My conclusion is that as much as you have to set the limitations of design, well, you, how much you can do, you can do, you have you also have to accept the limitations of participation and take credit and blame for what you do. So, uh, so it, it, I mean, the tension is well, this is not done on behalf of anyone. This is what I do, and if it fails, it fails. If it, if it succeeds, it succeeds. But I'm not claiming that I'm facing myself. And but the community is thinking, sorry? But, so, but simply naming yourself doesn't solve the problem either. No, it doesn't. But it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't solve the problem because you cannot solve the problem. Yeah. You have, you are going to. I, I remember with, with, that, with architects saying, you know, all this uh, participatory design bullshit, as they say. Uh, in the end, if there's a suit, I am the one responsible, I'm the one going to jail. Right. So uh, I have to take full responsibility of this. I can say that, that, that but I cannot pretend that uh, I am, that the people are speaking through me. And, and that, of course, is a very complex political position because uh, then you can be rightly accused that, uh, of you know, parachuting in and solving the problem for the people. Uh, but you cannot. Uh, uh, I think the way, what is impossible to achieve is this uh, untransparent, and I'm just a side uh, guy. No, I, I agree with that, but I guess what I'm saying is I also think there's a problem with not I mean, being just, explicitly yeah. acknowledging the yeah. different power relations yeah. that are involved yeah, in whatever yeah, concrete yeah, yeah. setting you're dealing with. Uh, so that it doesn't just become another mode, trendy mode of behavior that signals. Yeah. Uh, I want to make sure that so uh, that we're able to get out of six. Deborah, um, do you have a quick? I just want to know. Oh yeah, question. sure. And it's so the last the is that you um, commit to being the designer in the community for a very long time. Yeah. So Teddy Cruz has been working with Casa Company yeah. for twenty years. We design a robot in a in a field center where we work for ten years. So it is uh, we design it with them and we live with them and we change. And, which doesn't mean that you are playing in on an equal field. I mean, you are the designer, and you have to take responsibility for the decisions that you make, and you bring yeah, yeah. But you're breaking the cycle of, of yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So you, I mean, you, you can that's a fantastic ending comment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much.